<laughs> Thank you all for inviting me. Uh, I'm, I'm going to reprise in, in many ways everything that Matthew's just said. Um, we had uh, planned to start on a, uh, a study of analysis of breast milk from, from women in Lima. And we have just begun that because our HPLC decided that it was not going to pump uh, uh, sometime last fall, and so we, we were delayed in getting started. But uh, I have some, some data, and, and we'll talk about that. But before I really get into talking about uh, carotenoids in, in our work and in milk, I wanted to take a moment and, and talk to you about American Pharaoh. Uh, you all remember American Pharaoh won the Belmont Stakes by, by uh, eight links or something like that. And, and, and of course, there are these three great horse races in, in, in the United States that starts with the Kentucky Derby. And, and there are three great carotenoids meetings that, that certainly uh, also start right here, and, and you are all present. And so uh, uh, thanks for all coming here. But there are two more events uh, in the Triple Crown, and I'd like to be sure that all of you put these on your calendar and think about them. And, and we have the Gordon Conference, which is going to be next, next year. It will be in May and it will be in Tuscany. Uh, so uh, come ready to, to taste a little Italian wine. And then in 2017, in mid-July, we have the 18th International Symposium on Carotenoids. And as the president of the International Carotenoid Society, I dearly want you all to uh, think about these, put them on your calendar, and, and uh, plan to uh, get together again with us. So that's the triple crown of carotenoids. Um, Macular pigment is, is how we all started, certainly how we all started. And very recently, in the last several years, uh, we have been analyzing uh, retinas that uh, we were able to uh, obtain through uh, working with Martha Nuringer. She's, she's a source of, of so many great studies, and, and we're delighted to have been able to show that lutein in the developing retina, and we were able to to analyze retinas in, from macaques and show that over uh, the two-year period, we, we could pr produce a model showing the rise in lutein and the rise in zeaxanthin. And you'll notice lutein rises fairly rapidly during this developmental period. The, the infant macaques are born with almost no uh, carotenoid present in the retina, but this is very rapidly uh, remedied as they mature. And certainly during the first six months, uh, Martha said two to three, they're, they're breastfeeding, their lutein and zeaxanthin are coming from the, the mom's milk. Uh, just to put a little finer touch on that picture, here is the RR zeaxanthin, and our analytical data show that actually the RS zeaxanthin is increasing at a slightly faster rate. That means that lutein is being converted to RS zeaxanthin in the primate retina at a rate that's faster than the absorption of RR zeaxanthin. And that's, that's probably a bioavailability issue in these diets, uh, but it's an interesting fact nonetheless. So we would uh, like to really understand uh, the source of these carotenoids in these developing eyes, and so that's where we started thinking about neonatal nutrition. In humans, the first six months of life, it's human milk. And human milk is, is something that, as you think about, you realize that uh, we as a species have changed over the millennia, over the millions of years, in fact. And the milk that we consume has changed as we have evolved. It is a, a uh, nutrient source for our infants that is well matched and well selected for to provide them their important nutrient needs. Strangely enough, we as carotenoid scientists know very little and have very little understanding truly of the factors that control the levels of carotenoids in human milk. And so what I'm going to do is take you on a historical romp starting from the, the beginning of our analysis of carotenoids in human milk up through the present. And so I'm gonna, gonna trample over a little bit of the, the topics that, that Matthew talked about, but I'm gonna start a little bit before that as well. We know basic nutrition here that milk contains proteins, lipids, and oligosaccharides. And what Matthew was just telling you is that when we make formula, we throw those all into uh, a can, we shake them up, 
uh, we homogenize them, we pasteurize them, and we get out a fluffy powder that the, the moms then reconstitute two or three years down the road, hopefully, hopefully less than that. Uh, but human milk, just for quick reference, contains about 1% protein, about 4% fat, and about 7% uh, lactose, the principal uh, sugar present. By comparison, cow's milk has about 3% protein, and the amount of lactose is quite a bit lo lower. The amount of fat in the, is, is, is somewhere comparable. Uh, so uh, this is a sense of, of the way things look. Let's look at the proteins uh, real quickly here. Uh, casein's the dominant protein in milk, but in, in human milk, it represents 20 to 45, depending upon the stage of lactation, uh, of the amount, uh, amount of protein in milk. Uh, whereas in cow's milk, for contrast, it's about 80%. So species to species, there's a huge variation in the composition of milk, and, and that's shown here in the proteins. Uh, casein is, of course, that, that component of milk that is, is, is forming large uh, protein micelles. It's, it's centered around or clustered around calcium phosphate, and it precipitates out to make the curds when we make uh, cottage cheese, right? The, the remaining portion, the, the whey, is, is these other proteins. Now, this is a very small list of proteins because there, there are really literally hundreds of proteins present, and, and the analysis and our knowledge of those is very limited. But these, these are certainly the, the big ones that are, are well known. And notice that the uh, uh, albumin here is, is glycosylated as, as as is this one. So glycosylation is a very important factor in proteins in uh, mother's milk. And this glycosylation is important because bacteria, which colonize our guts, and we're hearing a lot about the microbial biome, uh, these, these bacteria have receptors for um, the, the sugars, and by glycosylating the proteins, they bind to many of the, the pathogenic bacteria, preventing them from uh, colonizing on, on the gut wall and, and uh, creating pathogenic conditions. And so this actually favors benevolent bacteria growth within the, uh, within the gut in the early stages of, uh, of uh, the infant's growth. The principal uh, sugar is, of course, lactose, which is a glu glucose-galactose uh, disaccharide. But there are really a lot more uh, oligosaccharides in that, some as few as three sugars, uh, others as many as 22 sugars, and all of their functions are not well known. So this is a very complex composition, again, just like the, the proteins that we found. Uh, the lipids in human milk, and I think for us in carotenoids, this is, this is where the action uh, turns out to be. And, and so we heard Matthew mention and, and sort of uh, uh, grimace a little bit about the complexity of, of the fat, and, and that's because we have these globules. They are surrounded by a phospholipid membrane. The large ones are filled with triglycerides, cholesterol, carotenoids, and, and other rather good things for infants. Okay, uh, These are 5 to, to 10 microns in, in, in diameter in size. But there are also these things that have been recently discovered in the last few years. They're called lactosomes. And, and lactosomes are smaller than one micrometer in size. They aren't filled with these uh, components. They're the lactoglycerides, but they have high percentage of unsaturated fats. Now, the questions that are important are, how are these different components made, and what's in them, what percentage of unsaturated fats, and perhaps that is, is part of the real delivery question that we're so interested in in terms of this. So micronutrients. Of course, the micronutrients can be water-soluble or they can be fat-soluble. Let's focus on those that are, that are lipophilic. We're, we're, we're going to think about vitamin A, of course, some, some of the others, but, but most important for us, the carotenoids. And so those are likely all in the uh, solubilized in the, in the lipid components. Now, I want to start thinking historically about carotenoids. If you go back in the literature, you'll find reports of, of beta-carotene analysis. And, and the people were doing beta-carotene analysis back uh, in, in the dark ages, 1979, 76. 
you know, this was the, the dim ages of, of carotenoid analysis in breast milk. They were extracting the lipid components. They were redissolving that and putting it in their UV visible spectrometer, measuring their absorption, absorption at 450, and saying, oh, we have beta carotene present in, in human milk. Or not, because lo and behold, in 1979, samples in the UK weren't showing up much beta carotene, you know, uh, beta carotene, lutein, any other carotenoids for that matter. And, and we suspect we know why, right? Uh, because of course these are dietary and they weren't big components of, of these, these uh, mother's diets. Uh, Swedish moms and Ethiopian moms seem to be doing a little bit better. So we have to think about uh, how the analyses were carried out. And, and so if you look at the literature on human milk and you see beta carotene reported, look at the date of that paper, look at the, the review and see, see where that data came from. If it came pre-1990, uh, uh, there's a very good chance that they were doing uh, UV analysis and they were not discriminating between the carotenoids. They're reporting everything as beta carotene. And clearly, we know better now. So be cautious in reading the literature. The first HPLC analyses really didn't happen for human milk until 1990, which is amazing, you know. Here, here for, for about a decade and a half, HPLCs had been out there and people were using them, but uh, for human milk, we didn't see reports until 1990. So I'm going to just give you a quick overview of the trends. You also know this from what Matthew was saying, so I, I think it makes uh, sense to, to recap it right here. Breast milk carotenoid concentrations vary greatly among countries, okay? Uh, you know, the patterns of breast milk carotenoids are unique to each country. So not only do the total amounts of carotenoids vary, but, you know, the relative proportion of lutein to zeaxanthin to beta cryptoxanthin to beta carotene vary. Uh, and, of course, those are dietary factors. Now, milk carotenoid concentrations decrease during the progression of lactation. Colostrum is very rich in lipids and it's very rich in, in, in carotenoids as well. But as uh, mature milk is produced in later weeks, the concentrations of the carotenoids all decreased. Strikingly, the nonpolar carotenoids decrease much more than the polar carotenoids like lutein and zeaxanthin. And that is an interesting story in and of itself. And so that's what we're, we're going to be thinking about. And, and uh, George Leitz uh, published this, this nice paper from which he, he made a nice introduction. And so I, I wanted to reference that at, at this point and, and think about that. So our thought is how do carotenoids get from mom's serum all the way to the baby's retina? And, you know, this is the, the path it must follow. And here are the concentrations that, that we see as we go along. And I'm going to show you a graph on the next page, but this is in micrograms per deciliter. Uh, in in uh, Fred Kachik and Louise Canfield's paper, 1997, uh, they report 17 micrograms per deciliter and 2.1 micrograms per deciliter for lutein and zeaxanthin, respectively. Okay, those are, are very interesting. That ratio is almost 8 to 1 lutein to zeaxanthin. And I noticed in Matthew's paper, uh, or work, we, we were just seeing uh, similar kinds of ratios between the, the carotenoids as well. So as we go from serum to milk, we see a huge decrease by a factor of, of 1 over 8. From uh, milk to infant serum, uh, a decrease by a factor of about uh, uh, 1 over 3. And then suddenly, as we go from infant serum to the retina, a wonderful thing happens. And we get a dramatic increase in concentration. This is a 42-fold concentration into the retina. This is a back-of-the-envelope calculation, taking the size of the macula, the amount of, amount of the carotenoid, and just dividing the volume. So it's, it's really very back-of-the-envelope. But, but I think it still emphasizes the point that uh, the retina captures these carotenoids very effectively, effectively. Going from the infant retina to the adult, again, this maturing retina increases dramatically in terms of amount. Let's look at this, the slide of this first 
uh, four steps, maternal serum to infant retina. So this is the picture. Uh, lutein dominates in the mother's serum. It dominates all the way along and even dominates in the infant retina. That's not the case for the, the mature, uh, what, what I'm going to call the adult retina. Mature would be about uh, five to six years old. The, then uh, these ratios invert because mesozeaxanthin has been produced and, and has exceeded lutein. Uh, the total zeaxanthin has exceeded lutein in amount. So here we have uh, some thoughts about composition of milk and how it, how it changes in various ways. During the weeks of lactation, starting from colostrum, going to mature milk, we see very literally the change in carotenoid levels. The yellow color here is indeed carotenoids, and over a few weeks, that carotenoid concentration drops away, and we don't see as much uh, uh, of the, the carotenoids. Um, within a single day during the diurnal cycle, due to the intake of, of lipids at different times of the day, uh, different types of meal components, we see variation in, in the milk. Uh, with, uh, in a single expression, we see variation. We see the fore milk and the, the hind milk, and the hind milk has more fat in it, and yes, guess what? It has a lot more carotenoid in it as well. So what I'm telling you here is that when we go to analyze milk, we have a big problem. We have to know when we got the milk, what time of day we got the milk, whether we got a representative sample of that one expression, and did we get the fat homogenized in our sample that we analyze? Uh, this is, is turning out for us to be, oh my, a very complex situation. We're kind of learning as we go along. I, I think uh, it, it's a great learning experience, but speaking to all of the, those of you who might say, oh, human milk, that looks like a really interesting problem. It is a real problem. It's complex. So if you approach this, you've got to really think about uh, the composition. So things we don't know about xanthophils in human milk. Um, I've already told you a few things we know. We don't know the specific distribution of the carotenoids in those lipid globules. They aren't easily separated. So you can't just separate them and measure in the, the large ones and the small ones and, and get an answer. Um, we hope in our study to be able to relate uh, the various lipid uh, components and carotenoid levels, and that's one of the things, the endpoints of our study. Um, when we know that, we might learn a little bit about the next question. What are the mechanisms of transport of lutein and zeaxanthin into the milk? Uh, I've written active versus passive, but maybe we want to say selective versus non-selective with regard to beta carotene versus xanthophils or lutein versus zeaxanthin. And so those are questions that I think are important to begin to think about and ask, are particular carotenoids being loaded into the milk and in particular compartments within the milk uh, in particular way? Are they carried there by protein carriers? Or is it the receptors on the cells in the breast that make the milk that are selecting for, as we know, HDL and packaging lutein and zeaxanthin dominantly over beta carotene and the other carotenes in the milk? How do these levels change during time with lactation? There still is more work to be done there, and particularly with regard to the specificity of the, the individual components within the milk. And the last question I really want to, to just tie up the loose ends with, and I think I know the answer, is, is there any mesozeaxanthin in human milk? Uh, to my knowledge, no one else has, has uh, analyzed for this. Uh, but we, we are doing that at the moment. Uh, my student has a normal column on the, on the HPLC, and by the time I get back, maybe I'll know the answer. Uh, but at the moment, I suspect we're going to find that uh, there, there is no mesozeaxanthin. I think that that's going to be specific to the eye. So here is the very first paper where HPLC was used to characterize carotenoids in milk. And this is uh, Louise Canfield's paper uh, on uh, this, Louise, Patton, Jensen, and uh, it's, it's a remarkable uh, analysis that sets the story going. And so from there on, we have a lot of interesting things published. They published about eight papers over the next 13 years in this area. They were the dominant force in, in, uh, in milk for quite a while. 
and certainly we base a lot of what we do on what they've done. But they publish all of their work lumping lutein and zeaxanthin as one component. And they measured all of these uh, in terms of at least the early papers in terms of the total volume as opposed to in proportion to the fat in, in, the, in the samples. And so that's another fact that we, we want to keep in mind. Um, so here's the, the paper by uh, uh, Canfield, Kachik, and Fender. And we saw 17 uh, micrograms per deciliter for lutein in serum uh, for the moms and the milks about, about uh, 2.6. And now, the important thing I want to look at is over here, the ratio of lutein to zeaxanthin is about 7 uh, or 8 to 1. Uh, zeaxanthin is not a very high component in the retina. Same paper, uh, I want to look at the, the beta carotene lutein ratio. We see that as we go from serum, the lutein to beta carotene ratio is, is 0.8, lutein is less. Uh, than beta carotene in this ratio, it goes to a factor of two over beta carotene in the milk. Now, um, you know, this is going to vary over the, the phase of lactation, so there's a little bit more to this story than, than just this one point. Here's an additional study, and, and Matthew talked about this work very clearly, so I'm going to skip on. We, we, we saw that chi China was the high point in that study, Australia was low, Carotenoids in Australia, rep lutein and zeaxanthin represent only 14% of those carotenoids, where they represent 41% of the carotenoids in China. So the distribution of the carotenoids is changing, and the amount of carotenoids are changing country to country. Um, here's a study by, by David Thurnham, um, who's uh, been talking already this week. He and Victoria Jewell published some nice work on, on carotenoids, and they found that uh, the amounts, uh, and they reported in nanomoles per gram, and this is the other thing, when you start to look in, in the literature on milk, that it's a smorgasbord of units. And uh, so you, you're, you're always trying to figure out how do you compare one piece of work to another. And in this case, they're reporting back against total fat. And I think that if any of you go into this area, please report against total fat, because I think that that's going to be very significant, uh, because the fat levels change dramatically during uh, lactation. And so they report, again, lutein to zeaxanthin ratios of about 8 or 9. They also studied how uh, the amounts change during uh, lactation. I'm just going to skip on and show the graph. And during lactation, you see colostrum here, and then the drop way down. The carotenoids levels, levels drop. I'm going to show you another slide fairly soon, which shows you, in comparison to beta carotene, how lutein and zeaxanthin go down. Uh, David and Victoria were, were, were really uh, ahead of their times. This was 2001. They published a paper relating lutein in the infant serum to the plasma in the, in the moms. Didn't measure the milk in between. But you can guess that this is a relationship, high plasma levels, high milk levels of carotenoid, and therefore high levels of lutein and zeaxanthin in the infants. So we see these stages of um, milk production and changes from colostrum to early transitory milk to mature work milk. And so we can see that, for instance, beta carotene going from colostrum to mature milk drops dramatically. Here's lutein, it also drops, but not so much. And so this is this preferential uh, uh, retention of carotenoids in the mature milk over the carotenes. And it's an important question, is this, this just a solubility issue, or is there something much more involved? And you know, from our experience, I think we all suspect there's much more involved here. Uh, here's another uh, paper showing essentially the same thing uh, lutein being retained at much higher concentrations than other carotenoids as we go along. So now let's change the pace a little bit because this is George Leet's paper. He's asking the question, we have a vitamin A deficiency in many parts of the world. If we start feeding moms beta carotene so that the, the vitamin A uh, delivered to the, the babies uh, will increase in the form of provitamin A beta carotene, 
uh, or, or the vitamin A levels in the mom, will that affect lutein and zeaxanthin? And the answer is wonderfully no. So uh, uh, giving pa red palm oil rich in beta carotene, we see a big rise in, in the levels of beta carotene, but we see that, that uh, there's no change in the lutein or zeaxanthin. I knew I was going to run over. I'm sorry. I've only got a couple of more slides, and then I'll get to actually uh, some real data. So this is the, 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 the top off of, of what we saw a few, few moments ago. Uh, you know, I think Lisa might be familiar with this paper. Uh, you know, the, 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 the study here shows uh, how the breast milk and uh, maternal plasma are related. And if, if you, you uh, have high maternal plasma, you, you have high breast milk levels. And, and so that's, that's kind of expected, but it's nice to, to be sure. There was a lot more in that paper, I want to tell you. I've taken only just the tidbit I wanted. And we also heard just a few minutes ago, and, and what we look here are plasma levels in the infant, the little dots, versus the intake in terms of formula or milk. And what we see is if we're looking at human milk, we don't have to take in very much to get a very robust response in serum. And that's a very big problem that, that Matthew has, has, has dealt with. And how do you manufacture a formula that does that? So here, here's, I've got really only one slide of, of data, so, so we don't have, have to spend much time. We're looking at 75 women in Lima, uh, Peru. Uh, our collabor collaborators are at the Institute uh, for Investigation of Nutrition in, in Lima and they've been helping us to this point. We've been looking at uh, the progression of lutein and zeaxanthin levels in milk from week two, week three, and week four. We did not collect colostrum. Uh, these are uh, economically uh, 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 challenged women, single moms, a lot of them, and we feel, felt that the uh, infants needed every bit of the nutrition that they could get from the colostrum, so we did not get that. Here are the results for lutein and zeaxanthin for these three weeks. I would point to the fact that although these are generally decreasing as a trend, there's nothing significant in that. These are essentially all mature milk values. The important factor that I was surprised by, and I actually alluded to this because we had some early analyses last year in July before HPLC died, we have really much lower lutein zeaxanthin ratios. A lot more zeaxanthin in these moms, and that was leading us to think that there was something special about zeaxanthin. Uh, but we've looked at their serum now, and the mom's serum is, is about the same. So it appears to us, and, and one of the conclusions that we would draw would be that uh, transport of lutein and zeaxanthin into the milk appears to be principally into the human fat. I'm not, I'm not going to say absolutely, because there are proteins out there. They could be water-soluble. We're looking at some of them in other organisms. So it's possible that there are water-soluble uh, proteins involved as well. Uh, it occurs through a mechanism that maintains the concentration of the polar carotenoids in preference to uh, the nonpolar carotenoids. Uh, lutein and zeaxanthin appear to be transported into milk in proportions to the serum levels. And I think that's uh, something that's coming out and, and we're all interested in. And so I really want to uh, acknowledge uh, the help of my students and uh, colleagues. Uh, Vanessa Mendez is doing the analysis. Ramon Gomez is going to do the statistics for us. And of course, we've had some financial support along the way. And I apologize for speaking for so long. Couple of questions. I'm going to let me off the hook. How is the carotenoids and beta carotene absorbed uh, in, uh, from the gut, from the serum, into into the eye? I mean, there is there is a definitely transition point where uh, early you 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 absorb beta carotene earlier, but the serum levels of beta carotene will be probably stable. Why does it decline? And you know, in terms of the later milk versus the the, the early milk. I mean, what's the mechanism? Is it an active transport? I know you, you mentioned HDL receptor, and that's how it, you know, that, that's a so, population. But is so, there enzymes? Are there proteins? What's the transport mechanism? There are enzymes and proteins, yes. Um, what are they? Uh, 
LDL, HDL, the, the primary lipid transporters and where lutein and zeaxanthin and the other carotenes are, are, are housed. As we heard earlier, about 65% of the lutein and zeaxanthin is in, is in the HDL. Uh, about 35% is in the LDL. Uh, that is not mirrored by the carotenes, which tend to uh, be distributed more in the LDL. Now, so, so, so you know, fractionating and looking at these various lipid uh, uh, proteins is, is something that, by and large, when we measure sip, serum le levels, we don't do. It's hard. And so it's something that I think, uh, as studies go on, we need to do. But it's a level of sophistication that's expensive and, and time consuming. So to get to the answers, I think, is going to require a lot of very detailed work. Neil, back in the corner. I know you've got a question. I, oh, thank you. Um, I, I don't, oh, okay, Matt is still here. I, I think that a number of the infant formula companies probably have a lot of information related to some of the, the questions that you're looking at, but it may not be in the published literature. Yes. Um, and maybe, I, maybe, I, maybe Matt would like to even, even comment yeah. on it because I've looked for, for this breakdown of, of the various important unsaturated fats, and I don't find a, a, anything that's really wonderful to, to help us in understand that. Yeah, but I do know some of the things related to, say, lutein zeaxanthin distribution. Um, there's work that's been done, some normalization based upon lipid content, uh, and I'm, I'm going to guess that they probably have a lot more info on that than, than what we see in the, in the published literature. Right, right. Yeah, I think I can s simply say that the um, the egg I think gives some clues, mm -hmm. and also the um, posters the one the po poster that Maria presented on fos fossil lipids gives other clues. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I probably shouldn't say more than that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There might be some proprietary interests involved.